All right. Well, here we are. Oh, I have to put in my headphones so that I know that I can hear myself. Because if I can't hear myself, you can't hear me. Somehow or other. That's how that works. All right. Let's see if that's... Okay, I can hear myself. Hopefully uh, anyone who's watching who has, you know, checked in can hear me as well. Um, I know sometimes my voice is doubled up. So if anyone's listening and can just let me know, you can hear me okay. That would be great. Hi, Jerry. Uh, great to see you here. Thanks for showing up. Uh, Jerry, are you able to hear me okay? Uh, so, okay, great. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. And hi, Ken. I'm going to say Kenap. Hey, Ken. Hi. Hi, Ken. Welcome. Um, hopefully we have lots of people showing up, and if not, it's okay, because uh, if you don't show up now, you can always check it out later. Uh, it'll be recorded uh, simultaneously with YouTube and um, Facebook. So, um, hi, Wood Spirit. Um, really looking forward to the session today. Um, one of the things that I've been fascinated with over many years is trying to understand how the old masters uh, painted. And of course, one of the guys that I really, oh, someone hears me twice. Okay, I need to figure out why. That's just really strange. Um, okay. Um, okay, you still hearing me twice? Uh, this is Rita has mentioned this. Hopefully not. Um, maybe if I turn this down. I don't have my other device hooked up. So it shouldn't be twice. That's really strange. Okay, hopefully it doesn't continue like this. I can hear myself once. So, all right. Okay, great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so I've always been fascinated uh, with the old masters. Um, you know, there's so many of these old guys uh, who just were amazing. And, you know, they had very limited resources. When I say that, um, especially when it comes to pigments, so Rembrandt, uh, for example, his pigments were, well, basically dominated by a limited selection of uh, things like lead white. I'm reading this, by the way. I'm not remembering all of this. So, um, so uh, lead white, bone black, uh, natural earth pigments such as ochres, siennas, and umbers. Um, other pigments were regularly used, but these are his staples. So I can actually give you a list of his pigments. Some of them are not as easily available now. Um, one of them was called azurite. Another one's called smalt. And so these are pigments. Um, lead tin yellow. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that. Lead tin yellow. Um, I've seen lead tins, but not yellow ones. Um, Italian uh, yellow earth or yellow ochre, actually, that's very common. Uh, Venetian red and uh, vermilion, uh, Matter Lake, uh, Carmine Lake, Italian raw, which is raw sienna, burnt sienna, raw umber, burnt umber, something called castle earth, I have no idea what that is. Brown ochre, uh, of course, lead white and bone black. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons why, uh, a lot of the old masters paintings look kind of warm and yellow, there are a couple of reasons. One is because they were working with very, uh, well, they're working with earth colors. Okay. And they were readily available. Um, uh, they weren't expensive. So a lot of artists back then, you know, even the successful ones, um, they didn't spend a whole bunch of money on uh, pigments. Um, maybe they did when they had commissions, for example, like with the churches. 
Uh, the churches were very supportive of artists back then because the churches were kind of like Hollywood. You know, you went into church, uh, there was smoke, there was fire, there were bells ringing, and there were beautiful paintings on the walls and the ceilings. So, um, uh, you know, they didn't have television, they didn't have uh, Hollywood back then. So uh, going to church was like quite a deal. Uh, it was the biggest building in town. It isn't anymore. Um, so, you know, we've, we've gone, well, come a long way from then. And now, of course, we can sit in our living rooms and just watch whatever program we want from anywhere in the world, which is fantastic. And we can do this anywhere in the world, which is fantastic also. So, um, anyhow, uh, not to get off topic here, uh, these guys work with very limited uh, palettes, and they were basically known as tonalists. Uh, so they were interested in the value of the lights and darks and those half tones in between. And that's what, uh, well, that was their method of portraying uh, realism the best way they could and if you can imagine how magical this must have been back then because you know we're going back to the 17th century uh, before we had cameras and uh, these guys were magicians um, they could make someone look quite realistic and um, i particularly love rembrandt's self-portraits i think you know he did a lot of practice working on getting his uh, tonal values right and he also was a fairly loose painter. It wasn't very, very precise. Um, they were moody and there was a lot of depth to his work. Um, some artists, of course, were, were extremely precise and they took a lot of care and time. And some of the Dutch masters were pretty amazing to, to see their old paintings. Um, but I can say until, uh, well, 180 years ago, roughly, uh, was the invention of the uh, paint tube. So at that point, artists could actually take their paints out in the field and they could paint on location. And that was a real breakthrough because they started to see color in a different way. Uh, it wasn't about sort of brown landscapes and kind of staining a little bit of color in here and there. Um, it was really trying to get the impression of the, the, or replicate what they were seeing in life, to try and see the colors that were in the shadows, for example. And, um, of course, if when we think of Impressionists, we think of Monet, and uh, among others. But um, a lot of their paintings were about this idea of warm and cool um, and neutral versus high chroma colors placed beside each other in order to create a visual effect uh, that were that create a lot of vibration in the color. So today what I want to do is just explore a little bit um, the methods that Rembrandt would use. And of course, if you go to the classical schools, even today, um, there are a lot of people who are teaching the classical methods of, of painting, working from a careful drawing, which would probably be done in, mostly in charcoal, um, right onto the raw canvas, and um, in some cases starting to paint right into that charcoal, uh, using values to try and build up a, a, a value study, and, and working in layers in transparent layers, in a lot of cases, um, you can build your color up. I, I like to call it kind of sneaking up on the color. Uh, so you start out with something that's very dull. In fact, I've heard the term dead color, and, and you, you know, really, there's not a lot in it. Uh, there's not a lot of color in it. Um, the umbers are particularly interesting to start with. And I have a, a, a paint here. It's a Rublev paint. And I really like it. I've discovered this uh, company and uh, they make a number of different umbers. This is a green umber. It's an Italian green umber. Um, they have several variations. They have like a burnt umber and so on, uh, but they're, they're um, 
these umbers and these uh, raw earth colors are just really fun to work with because they're so neutral. They're gray already, but they are a gray leaning towards something a little warmer, a little cooler, or even a secondary color like a green, for example. And um, when you start with that kind of color and you put even a little bit of color of any other kind beside that, all of a sudden it starts to feel like you've got something, you know, more exciting. Um, I've heard the term that, um, uh, you know, values do all the work and color gets all the praise. Um, and it's really true. Uh, we look at color because it excites us. But if the values are not right, especially if you're talking about classical painting, I'm not talking about impressionist painting right now. Um, if your values aren't right, then it kind of falls apart. Um, you can get away with uh, poor color. And I, I use that term hesitatingly because uh, really poor color is just color that is not harmonizing well or it's out of place for the subject that you're painting. Um, and, um, you know, poor color can always be fixed, by the way. So you can paint over it by painting on an opaque way or glazing. So that kind of brings us to this idea of how to build up a painting, uh, working from very thin, transparent layers into areas that are more opaque and heavier in their application. Um, my old boss used to use this expression. He, he would say, uh, you can always tell a Rembrandt painting because you can pick it up by the nose. So if you look at Rembrandt's paintings, you find that his shadow areas are very transparent and warm. And as he goes into the light, um, they become more opaque, a heavier application, and it becomes cooler. Uh, one of the reasons why a lot of these older artists worked with north light was because the light was consistent. And if you think about north light, it's cool light. And I say cool light relative to what you would find in the south, because there's no direct sunlight that's hitting the north. You get reflected light from the sky in the north. So there's kind of a natural progression. If you start, if you have cool light, you generally have warm shadows and these are always relative. Okay. So I don't want to get too confused, confusing about this. Um, if you have um, warm light, you have cool shadows, relatively speaking. So I'm, I won't get into that whole subject right now, but if you're painting a portrait and you have north light, windows or say even of a skylight that's sort of facing north-ish, um, your light is going to be cooler. And when you add white to a color, any color, it cools it and lightens it simultaneously. So this was a natural way of working. You start with your darks and you find your way into the lights. Um, John Singer Sargent used to work kind of from the half tones or the middle tones out. So he would create his accents in the dark and his accents in the light and sort of reserve those for the end, if you will. Um, so how you want to do this is really your own choice. Today I'm going to kind of work from sort of darker half tones. Um, and I'm going to try and create uh, an image that looks, um, I, well, it's not going to look like Rembrandt. It's going to look like Andrew Judd um, pretending he knows something about a Rembrandt painting. So, um, and it, uh, the portrait that I'm painting won't really end up being a portrait. I mean, if it looks like the guy that I'm painting, I'm, it's brilliant. I'm, I'm really happy, but I'm more interested in the principle right now. When I actually do a portrait and I want to be precise, um, I'll actually start by painting it upside down. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'll take my reference, turn it upside down, and I do a painting of what I see upside down. 
because what happens is that my my brain understands shapes and values that way it's not thinking about noses it's not thinking about eyes and you know have i got the lips right i'm really looking at the shapes that are making up the structure if you get the shapes right and the values right uh, and you do that, you know, carefully uh, with observation. You turn it up around the other way, right side up, and it actually ends up looking like the person. It's quite remarkable. I also use a tool sometimes, and I, I'd like to share that with you also today because I know some of you are not very confident with your drawing, and even I struggle with my drawing. Um, at times I'm just like, oh, man, what am I doing? It doesn't look anything like what I'm looking at. But I want to show you something. It's called a proportional divider. Now, let's see if I can do this right. I'm actually going to turn the camera around here so you can see this properly. Here we go. All right. So you'll see this is the surfaces that I'm going to be working on. Um, all right. So this is called a, a proportional divider. It's a very handy tool. And um, this was introduced me, uh, to me just a couple of years ago by another art teacher at the Avenue Road Art School, which I'm very thankful for. And um, you can see how this works. You see, if I take a measurement, uh, let's supposing I have some reference here. I have a photo here. I can put this up against the reference. And on the other side of this, I can make two marks on my canvas. And that's going to be the right proportion. No matter what I measure on this side over here, if I make that bigger, it makes it bigger on this side over here. So I can decide the side of the head, uh, height of the head, you know, the nose, the eyes. I, of course, I can take these measurements from side to side and 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 you know make them larger over here. It's fabulous. It's really great. Um, I'm seeing a couple of people here have uh, these uh, tools as well. Um, um, Butch, yeah, thanks. They're they're fabulous tools. I really like working with them. Um, and Wood Spirit too. Um, I was talking about uh, painting the portrait upside down. Wood Spirit, I notice you've uh, mentioned Betty Edwards. Um, and she is the person who uh, introduced me through her book to this idea of working upside down. I think it's a fabulous uh, exercise to do this. Of course, if you're painting from life, it's a little tricky because, uh, of course, you can't stand on your head and you can't have the model stand on their head, not for long. So maybe there's some way of hooking up some mirrors or something to make this work. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to show you, um, let's just do this. So this is um, this is one of Rembrandt's uh, self-portraits, and when I look at what he's done here, it's just amazing because it's very loose. Um, the mouth uh, is in a shadow area, but you can still see it. Um, I love the textures that you see in you know in this, and this is not a super. Uh, high res image, but at least it gives you an idea. Um, he works very transparently in the shadow areas and then he's thick in the other areas. And again, it's not a high res image. So forgive me for that. This is all I could find in a real hurry. Um, it's great to look at his work and just see his methods and also look at some of the old masters and see how they uh, applied the, the paint and the light. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to paint, I'm going to attempt to paint something that looks like this gentleman. This is a photograph I took in India, and um, he has a really interesting face. That, uh, uh, he was a really funny man. He's, he's not with us anymore, but he had a great sense of humor in spite of <laughs> the look on his face. He would give you a, a joke very seriously but it, he was too funny had us laughing lots um all right so let me see if i can organize this the right way okay all right just gonna set it up like this and 
the first application of paint is just really going to be kind of, uh, well, just a, a, a value or a tone. I'm just going to use um, this uh, green number, this Rublev cover, uh, color, and I'm just going to put that down in a fairly dry manner. Um, I've, I've, when I say that, I've got a very light coat of oil in this area. Very, very light. So I'm just going to put something down just to get some value in place. And you can see that, um, by the way, this is just a piece of thick card, which I've gessoed over. And then I put um, transparent oxide red uh, into this uh, on the top of the gesso. And then I've taken another material called shellac. And shellac is, I don't know what this would be in Deutsch for those of you who are there, um, but it's basically um, a resin. It's kind of like a liquid. Um, it's used a lot in furniture, uh, for varnishing furniture and so on. Um, and it comes from a little bug. It's um, like a resin that these little, they're called lac buds, uh, L-A-C, lac. And um, you find them in India, I think in Thailand or something like that. Anyhow, they take this stuff and they, they put it in, uh, they have sort of this flake dry material and they mix it into alcohol and it gives you this kind of gooey substance um, that is very, uh, well, it's transparent and it also creates a great sealer. So it's, it's slippery. You know, this is almost like in a way painting on a table, um, except you can see the texture of the gesso that's coming through here. Um, very often I'll paint over like a mishmash of different colors. But in this case, because it's, you know, kind of more like a classical painting, I'm just going to go into it this way. And I've got a mid-tone going here. Just scumble that around. You can do this straight onto white canvas if you want, but I always like to have a little bit of a color behind. I'm just going to take a smooth brush. Um, a soft brush here and just smooth this out a little bit so it's a little more uh, soft. That smooth brush just takes the brush strokes away and you can see it almost even takes away the textures that are underneath here uh, of the gesso that shows through. All right, so once I do that, I, I'm trying to get kind of an overall value here. And it's not super dark, but it's um, uh, it's just enough to get going. So, hey, Phil, nice to see you. It's been years since I've seen your name. It's nice to see you here, thanks. Um, Moni, thanks for checking in from Germany. It's great. Love to see where people are checking in from. It's real, always nice. Okay, I'm going to take the same umber. And the first thing I want to do is give myself kind of a sense of where the darks are going to be roughly. I'm going to draw this in very roughly. And again, because it's paint, you know, you just can keep moving it around until it looks right. It's one of the joys of oil. Um, I'm really right now just squinting down so I see the very simple shapes. And I also want to get a sense of where I want to place this face on this board. And as I say, that's not going to be much of a portrait. I don't think it'd just be kind of a painting of an old guy with an interesting face, hopefully. You can see this is a heavier application, but it's still transparent. Even at this stage, um, I haven't gone into really, just to give you an idea, 
if I was going to paint really heavy with this, it would it would look like this. Okay, so I want to save that kind of stuff if I'm going to use it for the end. Um, there's this idea that um, hey, Baron, nice to see you. This idea that shadow areas should be relatively transparent and uh, light areas should be more or less opaque. And it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, we look into shadows um, and we look at areas that are lit. Now, of course, when you get into things like glass and those things that are transparent by nature, then that brings in a whole other set of issues. Um, but for the time being, for, the, for what we're doing here, painting a skin in this manner, we're working in fairly transparent shadows and we'll go more opaque into the light. So I'm just gonna, it's got a great nose. I love his nose. And again, I don't wanna get hung up on trying to become too defined at this stage. His mouth is somewhere down here. And it kind of helps if you've met a person who you're going to paint. Actually, I think it might be kind of fun to give him more beard than he has. Um, we'll see if that works. So right now you can see if you're looking at values, I just want to keep most of my area through here sort of in the mid range. And as soon as I start bringing in lights, and I'm gonna do this in a couple of different ways. I'll show you how that works. Um, in the background behind, I wanna kind of get the sense of the outside of his head. His nose is right about here. You notice I'm not using my proportional divider. I'm not gonna get into that right now. If I was going to do a very precise portrait and it had to look like the person, that's when I would really take my time um, and try and get that right. But for what we're doing today, you know, for the limited time, I just want to show you this process, which is really fun. By the way, you can, you can paint all of that and then just wipe it right out if I want to. Um, it's uh, a very forgiving way to work because you can just keep moving the paint around until it looks right. I think I've quoted my friend before who was just an amazing painter, um, guy I went to school with in Toronto. And I asked him, you know, how do you make your paintings look so good? And he says, well, I just keep painting it until it looks right. And I wish it was that simple because you know, you still have to have a skill set and at least some understanding of what you're doing. I like when you get these kind of texture things happening. This is something that, you know, Rembrandt probably would never do. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe he did all of these things and ended up with his own beautiful look. Um, but already this is feeling a little bit in the realm of classical painting. I think I'm going to go dark back here because I just, I really don't want to get into painting all the back and side of his head and all of that. So, and again, this is quite a, a dry application of paint. Um, I'm not really uh, trying to get into any detail -y stuff, just blocking if that makes sense blocking in uh okay let's get his beard down here let's get a dark area right in here where his collar comes up um for years i used to draw things down very carefully and plan out where they were going to go and that's probably my illustrative background you know you couldn't just 
try it and hope that it worked. Uh, the client was usually waiting for you to come up with a solution for their package or, you know, the book jacket or whatever it was you were working on for them. And um, you couldn't, it wasn't a hit and miss thing, you know, um, you had to get it right. So you'd, we'd take a lot of time and draw things out very carefully and plan what the colors would be. And, you know, we would give them a couple of samples with marker renderings and that sort of thing um, so that they would have an idea what the finish is going to look like. Um, and that's all fine, um, but unfortunately it constricts you. So one of the nice things about just painting for pleasure and having fun, like doing this kind of thing, it frees you to do what you want to do. Um, make your painting your own. That's, again, if, unless it's a commission, and even if it is a commission, in some ways, you should still try and make it your own. You know, people should be able to look at it and say, well, there's some real life in that. Um, I, I want to look at it longer. It looks interesting. That I, I can't see everything that the artist had in mind, but I think this is what they meant. You know, it's it brings you to the uh, the painting as an observer, but also as someone who contributes the feelings that you get. Okay. Now, I'm going to just bring in a couple of dark areas here. I've got some dark in the collar area over here. It's fine maybe a little bit of dark over here. So we have some dark there, here, and then back there, it just kind of goes into some mushy area. That's just gonna, you know, be something back there. It's coming out of the shadows. And I do like the textures that come through from this gesso. Um, that's kind of fun. It gives you something to work with, creates interest in areas that would normally be a little bit boring. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the next stage of this. Um, I keep uh, usually like old cotton rags and, you know, things like old t-shirts, basically. And sometimes um, I have like socks, <laughs> like old socks, like this white sports socks. And uh, I'll put a couple of them together and then I stick my hand into the sock so I've got like this puppet looking thing. And um, then I can use this to start to take out lights. And I'm just going to pull paint away here in the light area so I, you can see how quickly um, it gives me these lights. And I also like the fact that it's my finger in there because it's more organic. You know, if I use a brush to do this, sometimes it just looks too brush-like, if that makes any sense. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it looking like a brush, but I just like the organic shapes that happen when you take light out this way. And this looks a little bit, you know, crazy right now, so it's okay. Hopefully it won't look too crazy in the end. I like the way that big mustache comes down there. And there's that little bit of beard area or underneath this lower lip. Um, the other tool, which is very handy, uh, is your finger. So, you know, you can go in and can soften areas. It's kind of, if you've drawn with charcoal, uh, this is kind of the same idea because you can create these soft areas that give you a, a sense of volume. And again, because it's my finger, it's, it's quite organic looking. And I can knock some of those really bright areas down Sometimes just tapping like this gives you that soft transition as well. So you can really get a lot of control when you do this. It's 
kind of fun. All right. Um, <clears throat> what spirit? You've asked which gesso I use. Um, honestly, I don't remember what I put on this. Um, it's an acrylic gesso. I can tell you that. I know years ago I was experimenting with oil gessos and or oil-based gesso, and I found that um, it really sinks in, but it's also very beautiful to work on because the the uh, texture uh, sort of picks up even better. But in this process, it's much harder to remove. So uh, with, the, with the shellac over top of this gesso, it gives me a very smooth surface, but the textures are showing through. So I think you could use pretty much any acrylic gesso, I would guess. Um, of course, you know, I can't resist using a Q-tip because uh, it's, it's that thing that gives me some, I can get some drawing out of it. Um, it's more precise without being ridiculously precise. And I can just get this kind of thing going. I've got his eye in the wrong spot. It's okay. Just gonna tap that out there, darken that down. Maybe I'll just let the background melt into that for now. Getting the shapes right. That's really important. You know, I really want to get a sense of where the eye socket is and um, keep moving that around until such time as it starts to feel right and look right. That's really what it comes down to. A little bit of light in the eye right there the whites of the eye, that is. And let's go over here. Let's take out some of that mustache area and down in here as well. And again, I'm just kind of drawing it at this stage, just trying to get a feel for where those shapes should be. He's going to end up with a, a bigger mustache at this rate, which I don't care about. Right. Now I can go back in and I'm going to just to refine things a little bit more, start to get a little more drawing into it. And again, I'm still only working with this color and that warmth of the color in the background coming through. That's all I'm doing. I haven't used any white at all yet. And there's nothing wrong with actually doing an entire painting this way, if you want to. Uh, it doesn't have to have a whole bunch of flesh colors in it. We'll see where we take this. So I don't like messing around with tiny little brushes a lot, but sometimes you just need little texture in areas, and that gives me... Uh, the possibility of controlling that kind of thing. Um, I like, with a smaller brush, I like painting across the form. So painting this way as opposed to down through the form. It's just a softer approach. If you look at Sargent's work, you'll find that he painted with the form a lot. Um, he had that real confidence. Um, having said that, one of the reasons I think he was so confident was because he painted the same sitter, at, you know, 25, 30, 40 times. He would wipe his painting down at the end of the day. And, of course, people used to look at it and wonder what the heck he was doing. Um, but he was getting to know the subject so well uh, that he could pretty much paint that person from memory. I think at one point he was just so familiar with the subject. Now, because this is a slippery surface I'm working on, depending on how I hold the brush, if I hold it this way, it lets me lay the paint down. If I hold it this way, it tends to pick the paint up a little bit more. 
Um, both techniques are okay, but you'll see when I just lay the painting down, uh, sorry, the paint down this way, you can see how it gives you a flatter approach and you have a little bit more control of your values that way. I'm going to go in and just pick up again with this Q-tip. Uh, just pick up a little detail here. And I'm going to pick up a little bit right here. I've got him probably a little fatter than he looks in real life. It's okay. You can always slim them down. Um, I want to get that shape of his cheek right there is an important shape. It comes out right there. And that nose comes out just a little further right there. Now I can go back in with this smaller brush and just refine the outside of his shape a little outside of the shape of his face a little more. There we go. Talking and painting at the same time. That's a challenge. I can do it, but when I'm getting into real focused areas, I kind of think I end up talking to myself. Hopefully I don't say things I shouldn't. All right. <laughs> yes, Butch. Um, yeah, definitely the good old Bernie Fuchs Q-tip technique. It's very handy. Angelica, thanks for showing up. It's nice to see you. Um, it's not very often I would be so bold as to put a, the paint, uh, you know, uh, the photograph of the person beside the painting because, you know, you can look at it and say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. But um, again, if this guy's a character and if it looks like him, well, bonus. Um, all right. So the essence of what I want is there at this stage. Um, I'm going to take another kind of cotton cloth. It doesn't really matter as long as it's soft. And just go in and tease out a couple more lights. And his beard here. And maybe that little area underneath his lower lip. Right in there. And if I don't like it, I can always go back and change my mind. I'm going to give him more a beard. I think that might be kind of fun. The heck. No, for sure it doesn't look like him. It's okay. And... I'm going to go back into this area here underneath, which is quite a, an important area right there because it defines what's going on with his lip. I'm really trying to see as much as I can this image in values, um, almost like, well, black and white photo, but it's not black and white. So, you know, it's just getting the values working. I'm getting a little fussy with this little brush, so I don't want to do too much of that. Um, what I do like, I haven't done this in a while. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so I can even use the back of my brush to get like little details into hair and, you know, you can scrape things away. It's kind of fun. This technique is fun. All right. Now, this uh, next stage is kind of fun because um, I'm going to get into some lights. Um, I'm going to mix up a, a color. And in this case, I'm going to use a little bit of transparent oxide red and white. Transparent oxide red is, is like practically an orange, really. It's a very bright color and uh, one of the things that I realized that I don't have 
as a complement color to kill it with. But why would I want to mix a color and then kill it? That's the question, right? But sometimes the color is just too intense. Look at how bright that is. Um, green is, a, is the uh, complement color to red. So I'm going to put a little bit of Iridian on my palette. I don't have my palette showing, by the way, because I've had some real problems getting all my devices to work together. I've got a really old iPad mini, and it doesn't like it when I try and put it into StreamYard, which is what I'm using uh, here today. Um, so rather than have it kicking out all the time and making a mess of everything, while I try and get it going again, I just figure it's best not to have it I can tell you what's on my palette. I've got ultramarine blue, uh, transparent oxide red, and of course I have the, this Rubliv uh, Italian green umber. I have uh, alizarin crimson and uh, yellow ochre and cadmium red. And all of my paints, except for the Viridian, which I just put down, is a Winsor & Newton Viridian, and the ultramarine Blue, which I put down, is the Van Gogh painting, uh, paint, and the Rublev. The rest of it is all old Holland. I love to work with. It's just a, an amazing pigment. I'm still mixing up, uh, if you wonder what I'm doing, over here, I'm just mixing up a little bit more of this transparent oxide red, so I have enough of it to work with. And with the viridian into it, which neutralizes it, cools it down, and neutralizes at the same time. Why does green cool down red? It's a question. Uh, because green has blue in it, and orange, of course, which is like very close to red. It's almost like taking two secondary colors and mixing them together. So you end up with something that's, well, you can let whatever color you want dominate. So I could go towards the green side. Let's just, I'm gonna show you, it's easier to show you. This a picture's worth a thousand words. I'm gonna bring in some green colors and just put them into a couple of spots to show you what that looks like. And later on, I'll go into and warm up the colors that are in the cheek and so on. But I'm just doing this to show you a little bit of this. And I'm using a very fine brush. At this point, I can really start to draw uh, with my brush. And you'll the color underneath comes through a little bit, of course. So that helps me to control my values um, and gives me a little more sense of these half tone areas here that are i'm going to call it semi-transparent um and as it comes into the light it becomes more opaque i'm going to bring in some of the light color just to give you a sense of what that looks like against that greeny sort of neutralized orange What I like about this is that, you know, all of these colors harmonize because you've got um, this, uh, well, a limited palette, okay? So that's that's really one of the keys to harmonizing your, your paintings. Um, you want to keep a very limited palette. And these old guys, they had limited palettes. I mean, you know, we can learn from what they were doing, that's for sure. Go up in here, pick up the lights. I don't have to commit to anything completely. I really don't. Um, all I'm doing is just exploring the light areas, the shadow areas, squinting at it, trying to get as much as I can the feeling of the light and shadow, because really, that's what it comes down to, as uh, Andrew Loomis always used to, apparently always used to say, and I think in this book says, 
it's all about light because when you turn the lights out, you can't see anything. So that kind of all makes sense, really. Now, I don't want to get into sort of nitpicking at this, but you can soften areas into each other and get this mood of light and this transition of light of shadow working so that it feels more like a structure. I'm going to go to the other side of the face. Normally I would work from sort of, sort of large shapes to smaller. So I just kind of got carried away in that small shape area. Here we go. Let's get some of this flesh color going up in here. When I say flesh color, um, everyone's flesh color is different. So you can take any red, yellow, and blue, and you can make flesh color out of any red, yellow, and blue. That works that way. Um, so Angelica asked about alizarin crimson. Um, so alizarin crimson is very transparent in nature, and um, it's a beautiful color. It's not as light fast. It's not as permanent, uh, although I think now they call it permanent alizarin crimson. Um, it's better than it used to be. But alizarin is a cool red compared to, say, cadmium red. And um, we see a lot of those kind of cool reds, especially in older faces. Um, the cadmium red you'll see, the pinks you get out of it, you see in young children and, you know, uh, when there's the blood is closer to the surface, uh, like say on a, a cold winter day, you look at the rosy cheeks of a child and you'll see that um, it's uh, this really um, vibrant red, warm red. As we get older, our skin becomes a little more transparent and we start seeing things that are on the cooler side. You see greens and, and blues and older folks' skin. So um, alizarin, is because it's transparent, it sort of fits the nature of the subject uh, when you're painting an older person's skin. Now you can see with the opaque application against this, it's a very different feeling against the shadow here. So um, this can work really nicely to give you sort of the, uh, the sense of light hitting a surface. And you can paint thickly into the light. Now I'm going to just take a little more of that transparent oxide red bring a little more color in and paint in a more opaque way. And it's really, I try not to mix my colors too much when I'm doing this. I like letting the colors intermingle a little bit because it adds another element of surprise, really, when you, when you look at this. You can always go back and mix it more later if I really want to. And his face starts to warm up as soon as I start to bring that transparent oxide red in that isn't neutralized. And just as to show you how that works, I'm going to, here's some, there's more transparent oxide red in this. And you can see how that picks up the color in that area. Certain parts of the head don't have as much warmth. Like in an area like this, it can be quite cool. But of course, in the lips and so on, we see a little more color, a little more chroma. And just by doing something like this, let's just do this. Sometimes that's all the color you need um, to show that there's a lip there. I'm just going to put a little darker version of that in there. 
and of course the tiny little highlight that picks up along the edge of his lower lip the lower edge of his lower lip and when I put that in that should define that shape just like so now I haven't put any of the white of his uh, beard in and um, I really want to uh, sort of get a sense of what that might look like so um, what I'll do now is take uh, my white and I'm going to have the color of his beard cooler. And of course, it's actually the lightest light uh, in the whole painting. So it's kind of nice to establish your lightest lights and your darkest darks um, at some point fairly early on so that at least you know the range you're working with. So I'm going to take uh, white and I'm going to add in a little bit of ultramarine blue. I added in too much ultramarine blue. So I need to go back and add in more white. And if I was trying to neutralize the blue so that it's not too intense, maybe I'll just bring in a little bit of an orange, which I'm going to make from cadmium red and yellow ochre. Now, yellow ochre is actually a cool yellow. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. That's true. Um, I'm not going to argue with you right now over that. Um, if you took a color class or two, you'd figure out how that works. All right. So I'm going to have a little bit of a warmer shadow area in the beer. When I say warmer, more actually more towards the violet. Um, it's a warm violet that I'm making because I'm bringing in cadmium red. So you use cool, light, warm shadow. So I want to have a warmer shadow. And so it's going to have that kind of violet look to it. Now I may have a too light. We'll find out. It's probably going to be too light. I need to go a little darker. So I'm going to bring in some of the rublev and which is the um, umber into that violet and see if that gives me a better sense of the color that I might see in the shadow areas. And again, the color that's underneath is picking up and into that. So that's kind of nice. It gives me uh, some color harmony. All right. And there's a little bit of that in his eyebrows there. And a little bit of that color in the shadow area. You notice I'm going from the shadow area uh, in his uh, mustache and his beard and so on, because I'm going to put the lights over top of that. OK. Once those lights pop in, it should be fairly dramatic. Let's just see. If, uh, this is a cool light color. Again, that's got the ultramarine blue in it. And I'm just going to pop in a little bit of that there where the light hits his mustache and where it hits this little bearded area underneath his chin. And now you can see I'm painting with thicker paint. So what the theme of today was, the idea of it was that, you know, when do you paint thick and when do you paint thin? Well, in your light areas, you can afford to hit the paint in a heavier way. Um, so um, I can paint that more thickly. And it looks right because the light is hitting the surface. It's not going into an area that looks more transparent.
happy to answer any questions if you guys have any. While I'm painting away here, I do check the comments now and then. Kind of funny when I look at it. It's interesting. There's all these little warm areas popping through. Sometimes what I'll do when I get to a stage like this is um, I'll just kind of blend things together a little. So um, things become a little bit more, uh, well, solid, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word, but it just makes things feel like they all belong to each other. So I'm just going to take a soft brush. And I don't want to lose too much of my brush strokes, but at the same time, I just want to make sure that things feel like they all belong to the same guy right so i'm just going in with a softer brush just blending a little bit i don't want to get too much into blending that's because then it takes a lot of the excitement away from the brushwork but just a little just to kill some of those areas that are a little bit strange that have too much texture in them and I can pull a little bit of that white opaque into the shadow areas, but not much. I want to keep them transparent, primarily. And you can see what that does, just that little bit of blending. One of the things about painting this way is that you don't use much paint. You don't need to. And I'm sure, you know, when paint was hard to get a hold of way back, in the 1700s, uh, they were happy to be able to find a way to make their paint go a long way. And this is one way they could do it. Just spreading it around. You know, if you think about charcoal and what you can do with charcoal just by maneuvering it properly softening edges this is a good place where you can get you know some mood going and that sense of light spilling over the subject and kind of disappearing into the shadows you know an area like back here that is just not important to what i'm trying to do up here Now, so you'll probably notice, like, I haven't really done much with the eyes. Oh, that's because I'm terrified of painting eyes. So let's just drop one in. Um, usually, we tend to paint eyes first because it's the first thing we look at with people. But until you've got the structure around the eyes working, they never look like they're in the right spot. And these might not either, by the way, when I do this. It's okay. Just wipe it out if it doesn't look right. So just gonna pretend that's where the eye goes. Let's see if it works. Already this one's not working. You can see that. Okay, that little shape helped. Again, I don't want to be thinking about drawing or painting eyes. I'm wanting to think about shapes. What are the shapes that are around the eyes that make it look like it could be an eye? And I also want to keep looking at the outside shape of his head to try and get that working. Now, I'm looking at the area around his mouth. I've got the mustache too big right there. The, the mouth isn't exactly in the right position. Um, and maybe his nose needs to be a little bigger. So I think if I bring his nose down, that might help. So let's see what happens if I do that. Well, before I do that, um, I'm going to wipe away a bit of the paint that is right there. It's going to literally scrape it away. Look at that. It goes right back to that color that's in underneath. Nothing wrong with that. 
And it's got like a big orangey blobby section there. That's funny. All right, I'm gonna bring the nose down. And again, I'm just drawing into it. Um, it's just paint. You can do whatever you want with this stuff. And get his nose in the right place. When I get that working, I have a feeling the mustache might be a better proportion. And I need that little indentation over here that kind of gives us a sense where his cheek goes. And I also need to make sure that I get this shape here working in the right place. This one here in the right place. And that's the drawing part of things, you know. Um, always think about the idea, at least, that it's possible to correct as you go along. All the time you can do that. Constantly correcting, constantly observing, because that's what the journey is. It's not about the finished image at this stage, certainly. Um, it's about trying to figure out what shapes are, are working and what aren't, and, you know, where should they go? Um, I've got his eye in the wrong place. This eye right here, it's in the wrong place, and it doesn't look right. So... What I can do is I can just take that right out of there. So let's do it. And I'll just scrape that out right there. It looks really strange when I do this. A lot of times when I do this, people kind of wonder what the heck is he? He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, you're right. I didn't. If I had known what I was doing and did it right the first time, I wouldn't have to redo it. But the joy is going back and finding out how to do it right. Make your mistakes. Don't be afraid to make those mistakes. They're lessons. And now I've done that, that eye is in the wrong place. It's got to be lower. So I'm going to go right over that. There we go. I really want to, those eyes to line up in the right place. So right now I'm just making a mucky mess. It's okay. It's a neutral color. It's not a big deal. Alrighty, that's better. I think. Okay. I'm going to go back into these shapes around the eye. Um, paint isn't permanent until it dries, and even after it dries, it's not really permanent because you can paint over top of it again, right? So that's just something to think about. I want to get that big area under his eye working. And this shape here working. That one there working. Picked up a little dark where I didn't want to. So there we go. Let's go in. And right now I'm just mushing paint around. So that's all it is. Pick up a little bit of the dark for his eyebrow there. And I'm going to pick up an accent for his eyebrow in underneath here. I've got his eyes really close together. See that? So if that's the case, I need to move the eye over. I'm going to get rid of this right here. I 
sometimes when I do these things, I think it's better not to have too much information. In fact, this might be a better painting if I don't have any of the information there. Um, yeah, I'm going to just try this just for fun. I'm going to get rid of this whole area right here. Scrape it away. I'm going to go in with my dark, uh, this uh, umber color, and I'm just going to block that right in. Take it down this way. It's kind of fun when you see the brush strokes through there also sometimes. I kind of like that. Um, all right. Now let's see. Bring. I want to get that bag that's under his eye working. And then the eyebrow comes up in there. It's got to work with the other side. Now what's missing is part of his forehead. So I'm going to bring a little bit of that over here. What I want to end up with is, um, if it's not a portrait, at least maybe a good painting or something that looks interesting to look at as a painting. So I'm going to bring a little more color in and... I'm going to give this guy a little bit of life. You can see to watch my value in a, a place like that. I want to look at his head as a complete unit. That's one of the things that is the challenge here. Um, it's not all little bits and pieces put together. It's one big unit. And if you think of it that way, it holds better. It, it feels more believable. Already I like this better because it feels, it feels like it's a, a complete head somehow. Maybe it's not his head. It doesn't matter. I'm just exploring right now. Give yourself permission to do that. Just give yourself the permission to get in and play and just keep looking at the shapes until the shapes are looking right for you. Now you notice I've picked up a bigger brush because it forces me to think in larger shapes. That's what it does. And larger shapes are the ones that we look at, and they're the ones that we pay attention to, and, and they're more believable also. Now, this guy doesn't have a flowing beard. It's kind of scraggly, and it picks up in a few spots. But uh, you can make it any kind of beard you want. So if I wanted to, I could actually give him like a long flowing beard, you know, that comes out this way. Why not? could do that give him a, a full beard I'm gonna do that why not it's kind of fun and I can take this away here go back in with a dark against that And that's not too bad. I don't mind that. Give this, give him more shoulder over here. So it looks like he's turned and looking back this way. I'm making him look younger when I do this. 
younger and heavier. Doesn't look anything like a Rembrandt right now, which probably will never look like a Rembrandt. But the principles of light and shadow and thick and thin are the same general idea. If there are brush strokes that you like, if there's something that's working for you, you should leave it. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be afraid to go back over it again, um, because sometimes a brush stroke looks really great as you're going along, and then you later you realize, well, actually, it doesn't fit with the whole painting very well. So, um, but leave yourself the possibility of leaving a brush stroke that's fresh and that's working. It's okay to exaggerate the features a little also. If you look at Sargent's paintings, you'll find he exaggerated his sitters a lot in some cases. So he would just really push the features until it wasn't just a portrait. It was a, almost a caricature, but it was a good painting first and foremost. All right, let's just see if I can do something with this eye. See, I'm still avoiding the eye here. I'm going to go in dark this time. And then I'll pull out the lights where I think they need to be. I like this uh, guy as a character, actually. Um, he looks uh, kind of like a biker. <laughs> All right. Now bring in a little bit more color. I'm going to bring in that lizard and crimson. And a touch of that, actually, and a touch of cad red. And bring a bit of color into areas where you might see it. Like here. Maybe in here. And definitely tip of the nose. And from the reference, you can see it's the light has kind of washed the color out there. But I can put color in where I want to. You know, that's okay. This isn't a camera. This is a paintbrush, so I get to pick and choose where I want the color to go. Huh. That's a, a great uh, statement, Butch. Yeah, people said Sargent's portraits look more like his subjects than his subjects did. And I have a feeling that he really caught the character of the individual. Um, he spent a lot of time with some of them, and um, he got to know them. So I have a feeling, well, I have some theories around why he would paint and repaint and overpaint and, you know, just work the paintings until he was happy with it. One of those theories I have, and of course, there's nothing written about it, but he had some fairly wealthy patrons, Um you know, they would pay almost anything to have a sergeant painting. That was kind of the thing back then to have a sergeant painting if you were wealthy. And um, he would be invited to stay at uh, the patron's residence in a lot of cases. Some cases he would have them haul all their furniture and everything they needed for props to Venice where he had a studio, uh, at least one of his studios. But in other cases, he would actually stay at, uh, the, you know, the patron's home. And um, I think it was a pretty good life. He liked to eat well, and he was an entertainer. He played piano as well. And uh, it was a good life. And so I think sometimes he scraped the painting down so that he'd have to stay longer 
I could be wrong. <laughs> Maybe. You know, that's just crazy. But, um, you know, it's kind of nice to be eating good food and living in a place that you enjoy. Oh, something happened there. Something kicked out. Okay, hang on a second. I want to feature this. Let's just do that. There we go. This way you can't even compare the photo. All right. Hopefully you guys are still able to see this. Something happened with my stream right there. Let me know if, if you can't see this painting, please. All right. I'm going to go into a little more opaque color and lay this in a little heavier way. Because this is about thick and thin. I'm going to really punch some of this stuff up. This might be too light. All right. That's a little too light. It's going to go in here. I want to really try and get some thick paint going here. So mixing a batch up and see if I can get a color that's going to work. Bring in a little heavier application. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, okay, Angelica, you've asked a, an interesting question. Um, it's not the same to paint a portrait after a photo. Uh, of course, it's possible, but not the same. So when you're, you think about a photograph, it is a flattened image. That's what it is. I mean, it's, you know, uh, seen through the lens of a camera, which is basically a singular point of view. But we, when as artists, we have two eyes. And so we're actually seeing more than a camera does because our eyes are apart um, from each other. And so we triangulate when we look at the subject that's in front of us. And when we do that, we're actually seeing, it sounds crazy, but we're seeing both sides of the face. You, know, you can try this in the mirror if you want. You can close one eye and close the other and see how much more of your, your face you see on one side or the other when you have both eyes working. And you see differently through each eye. So our brain compiles that information, puts it together, and we're able to literally see more than a camera does. Um, it's quite amazing when you think about it. So when you're painting from life, you have an opportunity to see not only more than a camera does, but you also have an opportunity to get a sense of the character of the ind individual. And the nuances of that person, you know, what is their personality like? What are they, you know, what are their subtle expressions like? And I think that that gives us a real advantage over, I'm not saying that a photograph can't be beautiful, that a photographic portrait can't be amazing. I look at some of Karsha's photos, you know, the one of Churchill, which he's famous for. Um, it's a fabulous photo, but um, it's seen through a single lens, and um, that's that makes it tougher uh, to really capture the entire person, if there's any way to ever capture an entire person. All right. So... I'm just going to, where are we at time-wise? I don't want to take this too long. People will fall asleep and go away. So 
I'm just going to try and finish this a little bit more. Um, before I sign out. And I still haven't got, what I've got is two like big black eyes going there. I should really deal with this. I avoid eyes and I avoid hands. I'm not very good at painting hands. I shouldn't tell you that, but it's true. You'll find out if you look at my work long enough. I struggle. I got him looking like creepy eyed, like that funny video we've just seen with the lawyer who had this cat icon superimposed over his face. It was in the news. <laughs> and I love when this funny little character on screen looks up and down and looks really strange. It's, this is talking cat. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay, but it's just, it was in the news. Apparently, it's made this guy somewhat of a celebrity. The crazy things that do that make you a celebrity. If that's what you ever want to be. Now, there's something in the eye um, called the catch light. And I used to put it in with a, a brush, but now I, I put it in with a palette knife. It has to go in at just the right spot. And if it doesn't, well, you do it over it again. I don't know if that's the right spot or not. This guy's got like creepy gray eyes. So I need to bring a little bit more light into his eyes. Now the, the whites of the eyes are never really white. There's, there's always a bit of color in them or a bit of gray in them. So you have to watch. You don't make them too light or they start looking really strange. And I've got this lid here looking like it's drooping a bit. So see if I can Correct that, get a little bit of a dark area in here. Now he looks a little scared. <laughs> Funny how just a couple of little brush strokes make a change in the expression of someone. If I just pull that up a little further, maybe he still looks a little scared, but less than before. It, he's got like sort of a, a smile happening, but not. And <laughs> he's an interesting study. Um, I want to bring in a little bit more of his beard up into this area. And I'm going to scratch out a couple little areas here. It makes it look like he's got some, he's got serious eyebrows. So we're getting close to as far as I'll take this today. Maybe when we go offline, I'll take it a little further. But the idea of this is really to understand how that thick and thin work and how you can keep moving the paint around until it, it's looking right. Um, and not being afraid, you know, to, to do that. Like, just get in there and move that paint until it's in the right place.
to find the edge of his nose a little bit better without going crazy. And then at the end here, I'm just going to take my big brush and really drop in a couple of lights. Again, never a pure white because pure white doesn't really appear in nature unless it's straight out of a tube in the perfect lighting conditions. Just pick up a touch in here and maybe a little bit over here. We've got funny little spotty things happening over his eyes. It's hilarious. Um, now I haven't, um, I've kept this quite neutral overall, really, but what I could do is I could bring in another color. I'm going to bring in a bit of a blue um, in these areas here so that it just looks like this guy's not, you know, coming out of some weird dark background. Um, although if you look at Rembrandt's paintings, you know, sometimes you have no idea what's going on in the shadows. There's very little color, if any. And, um, you know, it's just coming out of the gloomy background but because we're painting the 20th century or something like that we can put a little bit more color in behind and make it look a little more interesting it's the artsy brush strokes sorry Sometimes it just feels like it needs more definition in an area with a little bit of color. And, you know, it just picks it up a bit. He's wearing a hat. Um, maybe I'll take a little bit of this color up this way and over. In fact, that hat comes down lower on his forehead there and even lower there. All right. Well, I'm not going to go crazy defining this a whole bunch more. Um, happy to take any other questions before I sign out or if any comments or you know if hopefully you've enjoyed this um i'm trying to do this every friday as long as i can and uh trying different things showing different techniques let me just come back to you there we go and <clears throat> i just want to thank you you know for showing up um thanks for your comments thanks for you know checking it out and please if you haven't uh, subscribed, really appreciate it if you do, or at least let others know uh, this is what's going on on Friday afternoons. Um, and, um, you know, I, I really enjoy painting. It's a lot of fun. I'm happy to share what I know. Uh, and if you have questions, um, feel free to, you know, let me know. You can always even email me at andrewjudd at mac.com. Uh, that's M A C. Dot com and um, you know I can try and uh, bring up the subject in the next uh, broadcast or a stream um, it's um, it's crazy to be kind of locked down but at the same time this is a way of reaching people all over the world and um, again I'm really happy to share some of the things that other people people have taught me and um, if you're learning something and you've found out something, share it with your friends and your you know, fellow artists, because we're all in this 
together in a way we're all trying to learn how to do things better you know to learn how to paint and no one has all the secrets and if they have the secrets um, and they know them all then they're probably unbearable um, and uh, you know they they're not sharing um, then what use is it really because art is something that hopefully lasts well beyond our lives and I'm sure it will so share it around um, and um, uh, be generous with your knowledge I think it's important um, it's the only way we learn is from other people who are teaching us so again thank you um, be safe and uh, look forward to seeing you next week um, take care and uh, uh, happy painting bye now